Hello everybody and welcome to the fourth Replace educational webinar. For those of you who don't know Replace, so Replace is a scientific platform uh, coordinated by Cian Sano and the Vrije Universiteit Brussel. And we are collecting all available expertise on the use of alternative methods to animal testing, also known as new approach methodologies, in one central uh, platform, in one central database. And today, during our webinar series, we are putting the existing, the existing expertise in the spotlight. And today, we will focus our webinars on the use and development of bacterial assays. Uh, before we start, a little bit of practical information. So um, every webinar consists of two speakers um, and each speaker will have 20 minutes of time for their presentation and there will also be uh, 10 minutes for questions. You can um, add all your questions to the Q&A in the chat and then we will answer them after each presentation. All webinars are also recorded and they will be placed off afterwards on our YouTube channel which is uh, freely available. And if you are working in the Brussels region, participation uh, to all four replaced webinars will count as half a day continuous education. So don't hesitate put, to put your email address and your name in the chat. And then we will uh, foresee to uh, provide you with the certificates uh, within one or two weeks after the end of this webinar. So then we will start with the first speaker. So our first speaker is Professor uh, Charles van der Hens, who is VIB group leader at the VIB VUV Center for Structur Structural Biology in the Laboratory of Microbial Resistance and Drug Discovery. He's also assistant professor in the Department of Bioengineering Sciences at the VUB and also um, guest professor at the University of Namur. His work focuses on multidrug resistance bacteria with a clear emphasis on the gram-negative bacterium Acetinobacter bomani, and his lab mainly uses amoeba, macrophages, epithelial cells um, as in vitro models to study host pathogen interactions and to better understand the virulence and resistance of this particular bacteria. So, Charles, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. So, I will share my screen. I will start the presentation mode and I will try to put the laser pointer. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Great. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share uh, my work, uh, what that I do uh, in, in my research lab. You nicely introduced my, uh, myself, so I don't have to do it. Thank you for that as well. And the organization, it, it was really nice. Um, Today I have to do the exercise of uh, using uh, that, that title, the antiphagocytic capsule of Acinetobacter bomani, but not to, to, to focus on the data, but on the methodology itself. So I, will, I, will, I hope that I will, I will make it uh, to that exercise. But one of the take home message here is that don't hesitate to contact me. If you need more details, protocols, I can share that uh, with you here. This is to give you an overview of, of what we can do uh, with uh, the infection models uh, we use. So uh, today uh, we will uh, check two infection models uh, to assess the bacterial virulence of a bacterial model. So the first one will be an in vivo one Galeria melonella, and the second one will be an in vitro slash in vivo, uh, the Amoeba acantame bacastellani. And I will pay attention to, to really discriminate between these in vivo and in vitro models talk about the advantages and the limitations, and uh, also explain you the methodology, how you can address population level analysis, but also single cell level analysis using these models. So the, the first take home message, I think that is really important when you use and you think of using infection model uh, is, is really, I think those four points. A model is by definition of a, a model. So it will never replace the, the real host because it's a model. So all the uh, conclusion you draw, all the observation you do are only in the tested conditions. It doesn't mean that in the real host it will happen, but likely it will happen. So there are always advantages and disadvantages of using infection models. And mainly I will focus here on ethical issues and the throughput level of the screening procedure uh, you, you might have. Also the choice of a specific model should be adapted uh, to the biological question. Uh, you have, and you will see uh, that in, in my talk. 
the three year principle of course should, should remain uh, a focus uh, when you you design your strategic approach so today i will really brief you explain you uh, acinetobacter bomani so the bacterial model we are using because you will understand why then we use these infection models so it's a top one a critical priority ranked by WHO and CDC because of antibiotic resistances. Uh, it's a gram-negative gamma proteobacterium and non-flagellated uh, bacterium. We need a biosafety level 2 uh, lab uh, to work with Acinetobacter bomani. Uh, and it is a ubiqu ubiquitous um, pathogens that you can find almost everywhere, but it's really uh, an issue and a health issue in intensive care units in hospitals. Um, they might uh, generate diverse infection uh, in humans, depending on the colo colonization site and then infections, follow-up infections. The, the real issue here is more and more uh, isolated around the world are uh, spawned drug resistance, so generating therapeutic death hand. So they are part of the most problematic uh, nosocomial uh, pathogen, escape ones, and they are highly resistant to antibiotics, this I said, but also they have a huge, they are champions in, in other uh, resistances like desiccation, disinfection, uh, human serum, phagocytosis, etc. Some isolates were only described extracellular, but more and more evidence show that we have intracellular behavior of this bacteria. This will impact as well the infection model we will, we will choose. So uh, to explain you the throughput level that we need in, in my lab, uh, I think this is a, a key turn because these bacteria are highly heterogeneous. So you have here a bunch of isolate of Acinetobacter bomani and the, because of a dynamic genome and a natural competence of DNA acquisition and integration into the chromosome, they are highly diverse. The core genome, the shared genome among all the strains is only 16%, one six, which is really low. So the diversity is really high and we isolate, we sequence new uh, Acinetobacter bomani isolate and we discover new genes associated uh, to this bacteria. So the pan genome is still open. So uh, to have a relevant co uh, uh, collection of, of bacterial isolate, we team up with the National Reference Center from uh, gram-negative multidrug resistant bacteria and from the military hospital uh, Queen Astrid. We also have a connection here with the UZ Brussels for safety reasons and we could uh, uh, use a, a, a bacterial collection of multi to extensively to pan drug resistant isolate that are also some of them carbapenem resistant. Uh, and we use that collection to better understand this bacteria. We have the whole genome sequence of this uh, bacteria. And to show you the diversity, here are four different strains of Acinetobacter bomani on a plate. You can directly see that they are highly diverse in terms of phenotype. So the, this phenotype that you saw, this mucoid phenotype, is because of the different regulation and the capsule type of this isolate, that this, this is the outermost uh, polysaccharide layer that protects the bacteria. And they are basically, uh, the, the capsules are basically uh, involved in all the resistances uh, you might find. So it's really like a coat that the bacteria can put and protect themselves. So this was the, the, the pitch and the context of our research. And you saw, I think you, you understand now that has these bacteria are highly heterogeneous. We cannot just take one bacterial model and work on it. We need to test multiple strain, which means that we need a throughput level that is high enough uh, to really assess the global virulence of this bacteria. So what about the alternative to mice infection that, that we might do to, to not directly test all this strain in mice and to decrease the use of mice infection? The first uh, example that I will explain is the Galeria melonella model in vivo. So to, to relate to the one of the first slides I gave, like the correct infection model should be related to the, the good biological question. Here is the first biological question. Is abomanis capsule required for full virulence in vivo? So you have here the capsule. You have a strain that is capsulated. You see here the gray zone around the bacteria. We label the capsule. And here this is a capsule minus strain. There is, we, the, the capsule was removed. So this is a transmission electron microscopy when you cut into the sample. 
And so the idea to test the, the, if the capsule was required or not for full virulence in vivo, we use that Galeria melonella uh, model. That is a non-mammalian infection model. It's also called greater wax moth or honeycomb moth. You see, it's this butterfly. We don't use the butterfly, we use the larvae. You see, they are two centimeters long. And uh, upon infection or when they are intoxicated, you have melanization uh, levels or degrees that are accumulating. So these are normal uh, larvae. Then you can have a line of melanization. You can have spots or you can have a complete melanization. And usually this is really when they die, uh, they are intoxicated. They can form a cocoon, uh, either partial cocoon or full cocoon that might take, be taken into consideration for any phenotypic analysis of toxicity. And you can also check the motility on play. So some advice when you use uh, that model, and I will explain you in the next slide how we can use it. It's really important when you use in bacterial assay, for example, to assess the virulence of bacteria, you need to use an infection dose and the same infection dose. So if you have a really large larvae and a really small larvae, then the infection dose might change. So having the same weight or the same age from the same batch of larvae that you want to compare is really important. The same origin as well, because they are also have a, they have a microbiota which might uh, influence the outcome of your infections as well. Pay attention that in some shop or in some uh, context, people give antibiotics to, to this uh, larvae. So if you have antibiotics and you infect them with your bacterial model, you might have issues because the antibiotics present might kill your bacteria, obviously. And if there are different lenses and ways, you might weigh them and put classes or subgroup. And in that way, you might uh, really uh, normalize your infection dose. Usually what we do is we take 10 larvae per condition and we always use a saline uh, buffer without bacteria as a control that the injection is not killing the larvae uh, itself. So as I said, we use the larvae in petri dishes, not the butterfly, because for obvious reasons as well, uh, having contaminated butterfly in the biosafety level 2 environment is risky. So we use the larvae. Uh, we use the glass petri dishes. Pay attention because if you put enough larvae in plastic petri dishes, they can move the petri dishes itself and, fall, and make it fall on the floor. So they should be really heavy glass uh, petri dishes. Why do we like that, that model is because we work on phagocytic resistance because of the capsule, as the title of the talk mentioned. And the Isla uh, Galeria has at least nine different hemocytes. So they are professional phagocytic cells uh, like your macrophages. So it makes it really an interesting uh, model for us uh, because there is no adaptive uh, uh, immune system. It's really an innate uh, uh, immune system to really phagocytose and kill the invaders, so here, the bacteria. How is it working? You have here prolex on the larvae. So you can inject bacteria, so your infection dose, but you can also inject the potential antibiotics in another prolex to check if the antibiotics is really inhibiting the bacteria in vivo. And then the multiplicity of infection here, MOI, this is what you inject. And then uh, if your bacteria uh, are not toxic, are not virulent, the, the larvae will be uh, as wild type and not intoxicated. If your bacteria are highly virulent, moderate virulent, then you might see uh, signs of toxicity with here the line tail uh, that is uh, uh, darker uh, or really like the, the full larvae uh, dark and dead, not moving at all. So if you plot the survival of the larvae, and here we have 10 per condition, as I said, over time, you see here, for example, that Acinetobacter bomani that are capsulated, after already one day, all the larvae died after injection. If you remove the capsule, almost all the larvae survive until five days. So to come back to my biological question, yes, the capsule seems to be involved in the virulent potential of Acinetobacter. So this was discovered in vivo and adapted to your biological question, you might use that uh, model as well. This is how we do in my lab because I don't like uh, that uh, we have the needle full of pondered resistant bacteria close to the fingers. So an advice is to put that on the tip. In that way, if you go too far, you don't have an accident because it, it's, it's really a dangerous experiment.
And uh, depending on the strains you test, you can have different outcome of virulence. And for example, here, if you don't have capsule, I told you that the galeria, they can survive because the bacteria become avirulent. But if you have here a lot of capsule, sometimes the bacteria are highly virulent and sometimes there is an intermediate level of virulence. So there is no correlation between highly constitutive capsule production and the virulence. And for one, only one out of 43 recent clinical isolates, it shows a limited virulence level, showing that the, the clinical isolate we have can show a virulence potential in this uh, infection model, which is, which is great uh, as well. So you see that with that model, we could even semi-quantify the virulence and compare to different strains. And you see that the throughput would be like medium throughput because we can test dozens uh, of um, of bacterial isolate at the same time. So uh, here there are recent highlights and, and my lab did a review on potential uh, intracellular life of Acinetobacter bomani that now some isolate can be redefined as facultative intracellular pathogens and not only extracellular ones. And people uh, or collaborators showed that in macrophages, you can have bacteria inside vacuole inside macrophages and bacteria inside vacuoles inside epithelial cells. So coming back to the Galeria melonella uh, model, uh, the main cell population in the hemolymph are circulating hemocytes. So you can even take a needle and aspirate the hemolymph. It will be a bit 4, 10 to the 6 cells per mL. So for 10 larvae, you can have 300 microliters about so in total, if you want to do single cell level analysis, like they did here for Legionella pneumophila in hemocytes of Galeria, you can have up to 1.6, 10 to the 6 cells to work with to do fax analysis, etc., which is already a uh, honest amount of cells to work with. So even going to the single cell level uh, by uh, taking the hemolymph and isolating the hemocyte from that uh, infection model is possible. So to wrap up uh, about the, the Galeria melonella larvae, uh, this is really easy to work with. And this is, to me, one, one of the main advantages of this in vivo model. You just need petri dishes, uh, glass petri dishes, as I said. When you receive them, you can conserve them for two weeks or three at 15 degrees to really uh, decrease their metabolism. And then you can use infections at 37 degrees as it will be done for, for human. You don't have to uh, feed them and you don't have to give water. So it's even something really uh, important compared to mice maintenance, etc. This is really easy. There is no ethical approval needed uh, to work with them, but we should take care of them for sure. But you don't have to uh, submit an ethical file for that. Uh, you can do in vivo drug screening, as I said, because you can really inject bacteria in one prolec and a potential new antibiotic in another prolec and you are in vivo. So it's a nice screening platform. But per se itself, you can inject your new potential antibiotic alone and check if the Galeria survive because it's a toxicity assay itself. And I think this is a great tool as well. Melanization is able to directly kill bacteria and fungi, and this is a bit homologue of the complement cascade we have in human. We have antimicrobial peptide and opsonins as well in Galeria. And the hemocytes, they are really functional homologues of the macrophages and neutrophils uh, we have uh, in human. To, to finish with the advantages and the Galeria melonella, they are really cheap. So you receive them, and it's, it was not even one euro per larvae, so I mean, this is really cheap and easy to maintain. So this is some, these are really advantageous. The second infection model that I wanted to, to share with you today in the last uh, six minutes I have are amoeba. This is the amoeba called Lacantameba castellani that I will uh, explain you today. So they are protists that feed on bacteria, algae, fungi, uh, through uh, phagocytosis. So they are professional phagocytes um, as macrophages. They are a major down regulator of bacterial population, and we know that a lot of several bacteria can use the intracellular environment to grow. Uh, they survive and they grow inside them. So uh, what I will explain you for amoeba, it's also true for macrophages and vice versa. 
you have phagocytosis based on receptor recognition, phagosome maturation, fusion to the lysosome to form a phagolysosome when particles should be digested, and then what cannot be digested is excreted to exocytosis. So uh, we can say that amoeba, they are functional homologs of macrophages. They look similar. And you see here you have Legionella pneumophila uh, growing inside amoeba, inside macrophages. And the, um, the strategy used by Legionella pneumophila to infect macrophages are the same as to infect amoeba. And macrophages use the same methodologies or strategies to kill bacteria that amoeba does. So they're really functional homologs. So uh, I will just explain you and explore a bit what we can do with this amoeba. Acant amoeba can be found in two differentiated states. The trophozoite, when everything is going fine in favorable condition, they are adherent like an egg on a plate. They are moving. Uh, you have one nucleus if you don't agitate the culture. Mitochondria for energy, food vacuole, and a contractile vacuole that accumulate the excess of cytosolic water and release it into the environment to avoid turgescence and lysis. If you stress the amoeba, they will insist. And this is becoming the resistant form. Non-feeding, a thick cellulose wall dehydrated, and then they can remain dehydrated and resistant for more than 20 years. If at some point the condition become more favorable, they can exist and go back to the trophozoite state and increase their population again. So how can we use that to monitor host pathogen interaction? Here it will be at the single cell level. You render, you genetically modify your bacteria to constitutively produce a green fluorescent protein or a fluorochrome. You have those plastic devices that you can seal because as a reminder, we are in a biosafety level two lab. And then you have access to a microscope here, it's a confocal. And if you do co-cultures, you just put bacteria with amoeba, but it might be macrophages as well. If your bacteria resist, then you will have the same number of bacteria before and after the co-culture. If your bacteria cannot resist, they will be killed by your professional phagocyte. And if your, uh, your bacteria can grow with the professional phagocyte, you will have more bacteria. If you want to be, a, to be a bit more resolved, what you can do is to test after co-culture, you can do washes and put antibiotics. Uh, you can do first washes and then uh, you can check for adhesion to the cells. If you put, uh, you do washes uh, and antibiotics in the medium, you check for internalized bacteria. And if you wait a bit, you can check for survival and uh, intracellular growth. So this is how it looks like. You have one picture with 30 seconds taken, and you see these amoeba doing the grazing that we call. They are accumulating and phagocytosing bacteria that are extracellular. They are accumulating the bacteria inside vacuoles that fuse together to form bigger vacuoles. So this is efficient phagocytosis of amoeba on fluorescent bacteria. And if you want to go into the single cell level, you can have this snapshot or you can take this culture and go to the transmission electron microscope that I showed you before as well. If you want to check what is uh, the outcome and the behavior of specific vacuoles, you can really focus on them and you see that here bacteria can be released from the phagocytic cells as well. So single cell levels are there. What you can do is, as well is correlative light electron microscopy and based on the fluorescence, you can observe exactly the same cell that was infected with bacteria using electron microscopy. And so if you focus on the vacuole containing fluorescent bacteria, you focus on that vacuole and then you switch to electron microscopy. You stack all the slides you did and then you can do a 3D reconstruction of the vacuole that was infected as well. So I hope that you saw that the amoeba might be uh, a really nice replacement as a model compared uh, to a higher karyotic uh, model. There is no ethical issues. I showed you some liquid infections, but they might also uh, be used on solid surfaces. Uh, this, I will let you uh, read uh, the, the, the advantage and the limitation that we can compare amoeba to macrophages for the sake of time. And just to show you how we can use them uh, on solid medium, you can put amoeba there, you can put bacteria using a Q-tips that you autoclaved, and you will see that over time, the amoeba will graze and eat the bacteria. 
And what we see with Acinetobacter baumani is a form of resistances uh, that is dependent on the capsule, because if you remove the capsule of Acinetobacter, they are sensitive to the grazing. So again, using amoeba, we see that the capsule is really involved in the virulent potential of Acinetobacter baumani. And despite the high heterogeneity, uh, this is a shared mechanism uh, among modern clinical isolates. You can do to the single cell level and do transmission electron microscopy as well. You have here the amoeba. We label the capsule and you, you can really work on the interaction in between this professional phagocyte and the bacteria. And then you can analyze also the intracellular behavior. We have here a, a, a growing bacterium uh, in, inside the vacuole of the amoeba and here some digested bacteria and some non-digested bacteria as well. So many thanks for your attention and I will be happy to answer any question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for your very nice and clear uh, presentation. Uh, it was very nice to see uh, what you all do in your lab, which is quite extensive. Uh, I actually, before we go to mode, I actually also have a few questions. Um, first, I was wondering, uh, you stated that about 16% of the genome was quite stable and that you have a lot of diversity in your bacteria. So I was wondering, do you see this as an advantage or as a disadvantage for your work? Both. So uh, a disadvantage, because if you don't see that and you find you, you fall in the pitfall, you might generate observation or even if you find a new antibiotic against one strain, it might not work against other strains, yeah. right? So you need to broaden that. But once you know that you have that heterogeneity, you might learn from it. Because if you test a new drug and you have half of the isolate that resist and half that are sensitive, you might do comparative genomics and find why they are resistant or sensitive and learn as a resource itself. Yeah. Okay, thank so you. Both. Yeah. Um, I also had another question, um, uh, because you also stated that um, the bacteria, um, allez, the larvae, it has an uh, innate immune system, but no adaptive immune system. So again, is this an advantage or a disadvantage for your work? So for us, it's an advantage because yeah. we really remove all the antibodies and stuff part yeah. because we are working on phagocytic resistance. Yeah. And I think yeah. what we see is phagocytic resistance because of this high capability of professional phagocytic cells uh, really killing the bacteria. So again, this is why I started with this take-home message uh, related to our biological question of antiphagocytic capsule and resistance. This is an ideal model. If now you work uh, on antibodies resistance, I don't think you should go for that model because there are no antibodies at all. Yeah. I was also wondering because you mentioned that you prefer to avoid getting uh, the bacteria from the shop because they have antibiotics. So I was wondering in case you would purchase them, is there some type of test you can do to see if they have received ant antibiotics or yeah, so for the larvae, if you have, if you don't have choice, and I can understand because it's difficult to, to get some, uh, I would always use, as I said to my, to my students, controls, controls, controls. So if you have a, a, a negative control of virulence, like sensitive E. coli that you can inject, uh, it might be a good idea. And if you have a virulent strain of any bacterial uh, model you want to use, if you have a virulent strain, you know it's virulent, you know the infection dose is there to kill, and the, 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 the larvae are not killed, it's maybe because they receive antibiotics that are killing your bacteria. Yeah. So positive yeah. and negative controls all the time, yeah. Yeah, indeed, yeah. And then I, you already briefly indicated it, um, that um, for the toxicity assays, you can use it uh, to test drugs. So I was wondering, is it already, do you know if it's already used now to test pharmaceuticals? And or maybe can you see applications for pesticides, uh, for example? So I, I know that it is used in academics and in papers, mm -hmm. but I have no idea if it can be used as an official validation system. This I don't know. Yeah. But it's so easy. And in fact, if you inject a new drug and bacteria, you always need to use the, uh, the drug itself as control. Mm -hmm. So in fact, you don't do an additional experiment. It's in the data set you generate, mm -hmm. you know if this is toxic or not. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for your clear answers. Welcome. Uh, Wood, are there any questions in the chat? Um, no, at the moment there is no question in the chat, but I also had one for you. 
uh, after your presentation. So maybe I missed it, but um, if I understood well, you used the uh, amoeba model uh, for to study phagocytosis. But what would be the interest compared to a macrophage cell lines, for example? Yeah, so for macrophages, and this is a slide that I had to skip for the sake of time, uh, but for macrophages, you really need growth factors. You need special media that can be uh, contaminated. You need 37 degrees, you need 5% CO2. So you really need to take care of them because they are human cells, right? Amoeba, you forgot uh, a culture, you come back, they are all cysts. You dilute them in fresh media, they all start again to live. So uh, you don't need CO2. Uh, they can, you can put them at 20 degrees if you want, or until 37, 40 starts to be a, a bit, a lot. Uh, so you don't need growth factors and you can work on solid uh, surfaces as well. So they are really, really more versatile and easy to work with, but they will not replace macrophages. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we use them as a first screening platform. And if we see interesting phenotype, then we go for macrophages and then mm -hmm. to the Galeria. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> um, and I don't see any other question in the chat, so maybe we can go to the second speaker. Yes, okay. So thank you uh, again, Charlotte van der Hens, uh, to give a lecture about your work. It was very interesting, and I hope that uh, some people might take contact with you, as I believe you uh, are very open for collaborations uh, to test uh, this larvae and this amoeba. So don't hesitate to contact Charla. Uh, I would be really happy to answer to your question, so please don't hesitate. All right, so thanks again. Uh, and now we can go uh, to our next speaker, who is uh, Ine Neumans. So we have a last minute change in the program. Normally it was Cine Le Queux, who would present her work on the use and development of bacterial assays at the VUB. But it is uh, her colleague, uh, Ine, who will uh, replace uh, Cine uh, to give a presentation on um, a high throughput uh, assay. And Ine is a pharmacist with a Master of Science in Drug Development and she graduated in 2021 from the Vrije Universiteit Brussels in Belgium. She is currently pursuing her PhD at the IVTD department, so the In Vitro Toxicology and Dermatocosmetology um, unit at the Faculty of uh, Medicine uh, and more in particular in the group of Liver Therapy and Evolution team uh, where she uh, currently works on her PhD. And she has a special interest in phenylketonuria and inborn errors of tyrosine metabolism. And now she will present her model to evaluate the activity of the bacterial tyrosine ammonia lysis. Ina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mika, for the kind introduction. I will share my screen with you. Normally, you should be able to see it. Yes, I see it. Okay. So once again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, indeed, I will present instead of scene. Uh, there indeed was a last minute change uh, in plans. Um, but today I will present um, a method that we've been developing during the last year within our uh, liver therapy and evolution team. And uh, this method is entitled a robust high throughput screenings assay for the evaluation of bacterial tyrosine ammonia lyase enzymes in the context of nitazinone-induced hyperterosinemia in inborn errors of tyrosine metabolism. Now, the title is a mouthful, but I will first give a short introduction about these diseases before I will explain more about um, the methods that we've developed and how we've optimized it. So first, um, here you can see the tyrosine degradation pathway. And as you can see also, five inborn errors of tyrosine metabolism have been identified at four steps of the degradation pathway. And two of those inborn errors of metabolism are of particular, particular interest for this assay that we've developed. The first one is hereditary tyrosinemia type one. And in this disease, there is a deficiency of the fumaryl acetoacetate hydrolyze enzyme. This results in um, the accumulation of toxic intermediates, including fumaryl acetoacetate, succinyl acetoacetate, and succinyl acetone, which can eventually lead to um, liver cancer or uh, neurological complications in these patients. The second disease is alkaptonuria, and here there is a deficiency of the homogentizate dioxygenase enzyme, which will result in increased levels of homogentizate. Um, and after a process called 
ochronosis. Uh, this can lead to dark coloration of the urine, as well as dark coloration of the eye and ear. And uh, the pigments will also deposit in uh, the joints, especially in the large in the joints that bear large weights. Both diseases are currently treated with uh, phenylalanine and tyrosine restricted diet. Basically, this means that all these patients cannot eat high protein food. Um, what they also do is they uh, administer a medical food um, addition to make sure that the patients uh, still get enough of the other amino acids as well as vitamins and minerals that you would normally get out of these high protein foods. And besides the diet, they also get a daily dose of nitazenone. And nitazenone induces an upstream block in the tyrosine degradation pathway, which will lead to a decrease of all these toxic intermediates in both diseases. However, as with any disease, the administration of a drug most of the time also goes hand in hand um, with some adverse effects. And here, the administration of nitazenone will result in increased levels of tyrosine, which then can lead to ocular and cutaneous symptoms, as well as neurological problems. So I think that if we take a look at uh, the tyrosine degradation pathway and the way that we treat these inborn errors of tyrosine metabolism, that we can all agree that there is a need for an extra add-on treatment um, to deal with these, but this acquired hyperthyrosinemia. And we hypothesize that ammonia lyase enzymes, and more particularly tyrosine ammonia lyase, could provide such an add-on treatment. And we got this ID in analogy um, of the way that phenylketonuria is treated. So in phenylketonuria, there is a deficiency of the phenylalanine for hydroxylase enzyme. And this enzyme normally converts phenylalanine into tyrosine. When there is deficiency in these patients, phenylalanine levels will increase, resulting in lots of complications, neurological, as well as hypopigmentation, and so on and so on. Nowadays, phenylketonuria can be treated by administering a phenylalanine ammonia lyase, which will then um, degrade these excessive phenylalanine levels into transanemic acid and ammonia. So if we go then back to the tyrosine degradation pathway, we can see that a tyrosine ammonia lyase enzyme or a TAL enzyme could be used to treat the acquired hyperthyrosinemia upon the treatment uh, with nitazenone. So the excessive levels of tyrosine will then be converted by the TAL enzyme into picomeric acid and ammonia. The ammonia is then rapidly metabolized through the urea cycle, while the picomeric acid might have some extra beneficial value, as it has been shown that it has antioxidant and hepatoprotective characteristics. Of course, it was, as with the development of any new treatment, there are also some hur hur hurdles that we might need to keep in mind. First of all, TAL enzymes do not exist in human cells uh, or in eukaryotic cells, so there is a risk of an immune response due to the bacterial origin of the enzyme. Secondly, um, the TAL enzymes tend to be not very active under physiological conditions. As you can see in the graph on the right, um, TAL enzymes are more active at pH 9.2 compared to pH 7.4. And what we uh, aim to do is we want to improve the catalytic activity of these TAL enzymes. Um, first of all, to be more active as well at pH 7.4, and uh, secondly, also because it would allow us to administer a lower dose to the patient, which would also diminish the risk of an immune response in these patients. But in order to create such a catalytically improved TAL enzymes, we of course need an assay to screen them. And that's why we developed a high throughput screenings assay that is based on the spectrophotometric quantification of picomeric acid. And this picomeric acid is formed after uh, the conversion of tyrosine by a TAL enzyme, as I already explained to you. And to optimize the assay, we used the Flavobacterium Johnsonii TAL enzyme, also known as the FJ TAL enzyme. Before I will uh, explain how we optimize the assay, I will first take a look with you guys to the assay setup. So we would first inoculate lysogenic broad medium that contained glucose with E. coli cells that contained the plasmid that encodes for the FJTAL enzyme. Then we would incub incubate this culture flask overnight at 37 degrees. And after the overnight incubation, we would dilute the pre-culture in regular lysogeny broad medium to an optical density of 0.1. Here we used a regular lysogeny broad medium without glucose to allow uh, for protein expression later on in the assay. Then we would incubate this 
uh, diluted pre-culture at 30 degrees until we reached an optical density of 0 0.6. And at that point, we would induce the protein expression by adding IPTG to the culture flask. Um, we would then incubate the culture flasks under uh, conditions that are ideal for the expression of FGTAL, after which we would take a sample, lyse the bacteria in the sample, and use the supernatant of this cell lysate uh, to perform the assay. Uh, and in the assay, we would um, follow the production of picomeric acid over time by measuring um, the absorption at 310 nanometers. But of course, first, um, uh, we also used a negative control. Uh, we went through the same assay setup, but we used bacteria that contained an empty vector plasmid. And this empty vector plasmid is in essence the same as the plasmid that encoded for the FGTAL, except uh, we left out the gene that encodes for the FGTAL enzyme. But before, of course, we can use this assay, we needed to optimize some parameters. And the first parameter that we optimized were the conditions for the FGTAL expression in the I. coli cells. Um, the optimization of this parameter was done by incubating various culture flasks at different temperatures, and then we would take a sample of each culture flask at various time points. The samples, uh, the bacteria in these samples were then lysed, and the cell lysate was subjected to SDS page. As you can see in the graph on the right, uh, the highest uh, FGTAL expression was obtained after incubation for 24 hours at 22 degrees. So we chose to continue working under this condition for the FGTAL expression. Secondly, we optimized the temperature of the assay and the pH of the assay. Uh, we tested both 37 degrees and 25 degrees, as well as a pH of 7.4 and 9.2. And then when we compared all the various conditions together, we saw that there was uh, a significant better assay response or activity of the uh, FGTAL enzyme when we would perform the assay at 37 degrees and pH of 9.2. And lastly, we also optimized the ratio of cell lysate that contained FGTAL to assay mix that contained uh, tyrosine. If you take a look at the graph on the right, you can see, wait, I will maybe first explain how we um, optimize this. So we would perform the assay with various ratios of cell lysate uh, to assay mix. And in the assay mix, we tested the various ratios as well with various concentrations of tyrosine. And this allowed us to set up these michaelis menten graphs on the left. Then on the right graph, you can see that the velocity of subset conversion was the highest um, with a ratio of 25 microliters cell lysate to 75 microliters of assay mix. However, we didn't reach a plateau here, as you can see in the Michaelis Venton graphs, which means, which means that our FGTAL enzyme is not yet completely saturated. And to allow for easy comparison uh, of the various FGTAL variants that we will develop later on in this project, we wanted to work uh, under conditions where the enzyme actually was completely um, saturated. So therefore, we chose to work with a ratio of 20 uh, microliter FGTAL cell lysate to 80 microliters of assay mix. Um, as here, we did reach a plateau level, and as there is no significant difference compared to the ratio of 25 microliter cell lysate to 75 microliter assay mix. Then we also chose to work with a uh, one millimolar tyrosine concentration in the assay mix, as here we are working in the plateau of the Michaelis Menten graph. So, under these optimized conditions, that gives us a final assay setup that is as follows We would first inoculate the lysogeny broad medium containing glucose with the bacteria. We would incubate them overnight at 37 degrees. Then the free culture would be diluted in regular lysogeny broad medium to an optical density of 0 0.1. Then we would incubate these culture flasks at 30 degrees until we would reach an optical density of 0 0.6. At that point, we would induce the protein expression and we would incubate again for 24 hours at 22 degrees as these are the optimal conditions for FGTAL expression. Afterwards, we would take a sample, lyse the bacteria in this sample, and then we would use the cell lysate containing FGTAL in the assay. And in the assay, we again followed the um, production of uh, urocanic, sorry, this is a mistake in the slide, it should be picomeric acid over time um, with 
while using a 20 to 80 ratio of FJ tel cell lysate uh, and SMX containing one millimolar tyrosine. And we would perform this assay at, nine, at a pH of 9.2 and a temperature of 37 degrees. After optimizing the assay, we also assessed its robustness. Um, these experiments were performed on three consecutive days. On each day, we would then test uh, three different plates, and these plates were filled in an interleaved signal format. Uh, this to make sure that every signal was tested on each day at each position of the plates. Um, and the assay robustness experiments were performed using a maximum, middle, and minimum signal. The maximum signal um, correlates to the ideal signal that we optimized in the assay. So we used 20 microliters cell lysate that from the FJTAL culture, culture. The minimum signal correlates to the background signal that we had. So therefore we used 20 microliter cell lysate that contained or that was obtained from the empty vector cell culture. And as a middle signal, we chose to work with uh, 10 microliter uh, of cell lysate derived from the FJTAL expression cultures. After performing these experiments, we obtained a general Z factor for the assay of 0 0.6, which is higher than 0 0.4, and this is the criterion. And the signal window value should be higher than 2, and with 8.15, the assay also passed this criterion. And additionally, we didn't observe any edge or drift effects, which means that the assay is robust under the optimized conditions. Beside the assay robustness, we also assessed the assay functionality, and this we did by performing the assay with two different TAL enzymes, namely RSTAL and CESAM8. And as our assay proves able to detect TAL activity for these TAL enzymes as well, uh, we can conclude that the assay is functional. However, as you can see in the graph, um, FJTAL is significantly more active compared to the two other TAL enzymes. So um, to develop a treatment or a tal based treatment, we will keep on working or continue working with the FJTAL enzyme. Now, the future perspectives for which we can use the assay. Um, first of all, we want to develop and produce catalytically improved FJTAL variants, as we will do by using directed protein evolution, uh, followed by screening of the variant library that we created in the direct in the developed high throughput screenings assay. Then when we select our lead variants, uh, of course, we would still need to test in a human based cell culture. Uh, so we are now in the lab developing um, an in vitro human cell culture model for hereditary tyrosinemia type one, as well as for alkaptonuria. And the lead variants will then be tested in that assay as well. But uh, the methodology behind that assay can actually be the same as the one that we used for the bacterial assay that I just presented. So that's also the nice part about this bacterial assay. We can just recycle it and use it again for our human uh, cell culture models. And then hopefully at a final stage, of course, we could use the developed FJTL variants to treat the acquired hyperthyrosinemia in hereditary type 1 and alkaptonuria patients that are treated with nitrosinone to reduce the excessive levels of tyrosine. To conclude, I will, would first of all like to thank you guys for your attention, uh, as well as my colleagues at the IVTD department, uh, the FWO for funding this research, and also uh, the Schwanenberg group from the Aachen University for the fruitful collaboration that we have ongoing with them. And if you would have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Ine, for this nice and clear presentation. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we still have some time for questions, so don't hesitate to put them in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I also have <laughs> a few questions already. So um, actually, you mentioned that um, we don't have uh, the tall enzymes and you expect to have a res an immune response with uh, humans. So I was wondering, how do you predict that this immune response, what it will be? Um to really predict the immune response is pretty difficult, um, but when you speak to like the clinicians that are actually treating phenylketonuria and so on, they all state that um, they don't tend to use the PAL enzyme because indeed they see a lot of immune responses. The way you can avoid it actually is by pegylating the enzyme, um, but even with pegylated enzymes, they still observe it. So that's why we want to make an FJTAL variant that is as active as possible um to decrease the risk of such an immune response mm -hmm. but to predict it 
it's also like it varies from patient to patient uh, whether you will inflict an immune response or not. So that's not very easy. Yeah. However, we aim to just avoid yeah. okay. to inflict an immune response. Good strategy. <laughs> I also had a question about the setup because you say that you tested between two conditions for temperature, the 37 degrees, which I assume is to mimic uh, human body temperature. So I was wondering why did you chose the 25 degrees? Is there a particular well, reason? Yes, we tested 25 degrees as well, first of all, because that was the lowest that our spectrophotometer could, could go. And secondly, because uh, actually we also tried to do this assay with another ammonia lysed enzyme, we didn't see activity there for that enzyme, probably because it's a human enzyme and it has post-translational modifications. But we hypothesized that um, the temperature of the assay could also form a problem um, when we would take a look at the stability of the enzyme. So that's why we tested um, the assay as well at a lower temperature to see if we wouldn't have any problems anymore um, for the human enzyme concerning their stability. Yeah, OK. And then I have two small questions. So you said that for future perspective, you would like to test it in a human cell line. So I was wondering, do you already have an idea which cell line you would use? Yes, uh, currently we're optimizing it using uh, HEPG2 cells. Uh, mm -hmm. We will make a knockout of it because this complete pathway uh, in the human body, it goes through in the liver. So that's why you want to use like a liver or a cell line derived from liver cells. Yeah. And then the other question is a bit linked to that because um, you have now uh, or you are working now on the development of this assay for a particular type of hereditary disease. So I was wondering, is the same principle applicable for other types of hereditary diseases? And how do you see the future for that? Uh, it is definitely applicable for other types of diseases. Um, normally, I work more on phenylketonuria, like the treatment of the inborn errors of tyrosine metabolism is more of a side effect, side project for me. Um, but we are also using the same principle of the assay indeed um, for, for example, to, uh, to develop a new treatment for phenylketonuria. And I think as long as you can spectrophotically measure the produced product um, of the enzyme, you can actually use this assay setup to test any enzyme you would like. Oh, okay, great. That's good news. <laughs> Thank you very much again, Ina, for your presentation. I'm looking at Mo to see if there are any other questions in the chat. Um, there is no other question now. Okay, so then I would like to thank you again all uh, for your uh, participation to this webinar. Thanks again to Ina uh, for stepping up last minute to replace Scene and uh, for your interesting presentation about your bacterial assay. Again, I would like to remind you if you would like to have a certificate of attendance, uh, please let us know by sending an email or putting your email address in the chat. We will provide it at least one or two weeks after uh, this webinar. I would also like to inform you that all the webinars are recorded and they will be placed on our YouTube channel, uh, which is freely available. And then finally, we are now reaching the uh, final weeks of the year. So I also would like to uh, wish you a very nice uh, holidays. So Merry Christmas and Happy New Year already. Um, and also finally, um, if you are also interested in presenting your work uh, during one of these webinars or our other events, don't hesitate to contact us or provide your suggestions for topics in the survey that you will receive after this webinar. So thanks again for your uh, participation and we hope to see you next time. Bye.